Thanks for watching ARC TV. I'm Rosalie Gilchrist. I want you to sit back and relax because I'm going to tell you a story this evening about the tallest couple who met and married and lived happily ever after. The story is by Richard Crow, and uh, so we have so many things around here that are close enough to us to go visit and a lot of history to study, and Ernie likes to bring these stories to you every now and again, so I'm going to tell you one. The first giant, the man, is from Letcher County, and he met a woman from Canada. So let's see how that came about. Martin Van Buren Bates was born in 1837 in the mountains of Letcher County, as far down against Virginia as the map allows. He was the last child born to John Willis and Sarah Waltrip Bates. John had immigrated from North Carolina and stood six feet two inches, which was still tall for his day. Sarah was a second-generation Kentuckian, weighing 150 pounds and standing five feet tall. Together, John and Sarah worked a good-sized farm that was bordered on the east by the North Fork of the Kentucky River and on the south by Boone Fork, a creek named for Daniel Boone, who had explored there a generation earlier. The small delta formed by these two waterways gave the Bates family enough land to raise crops and plenty of animals to feed their growing clan. Martin was born of normal size to parents and siblings of normal size. John Jr. was born first in 1813, followed by Margaret in 1815, Martha in 1816, Eliza Agnes came next in 1819, then brothers Jesse in 1821, James in 1823, and Robert 1825, Uriah in 1828, Sarah Ann was born in 1830, followed by Henderson in 1832, and Mary Jane was born in 1836. Now, in case you can't count, that's a dozen. Among the dozen, several were lean and lanky and built, but none were considered large. 2. Across the nation at that time came the Panic of 1837, which lasted seven years and featured high inflation, wild land speculation, hundreds of bank closings, and thousands of business failures. The Panic resulted from the economic policies of the U.S. President Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, as a native Tennessean was known. He had won the Battle of New Orleans and empty victory in the War of 1812, coming as it did after the war had ended. His policy to remove the Cherokee Nation from their ancestral home in the east to what would be later become the state of Oklahoma was proving ill-advised, Ill and his decision to close the Second Bank of the United States resulted in a disruptive downward spiral in the U.S. economy. These policies, while a disaster for most of the country, were seen as profitable for people living in West Kentucky and Tennessee at the time. Besides farming, John Bates earned money by trading land. President Jackson's efforts allowed Bates to borrow money at terms favorable for buying and reselling land. Jackson was leaving office, but one of his major supporters would become the next president of the United States. To honor the elfish New York Dutchman, John christened his twelfth child Martin Van Buren Bates. For young baby Bates, his first seven years of life were undramatic. Finally, at age seven, the panic ended. But as the national, national economy improved, Martin's life became more complicated. John Bates died, leaving Sarah to manage the family farm. Also in 1844, the baby began to grow. By the time he was 11, Martin weighed 170 pounds. Two years later, he was larger than most men, weighing 300 pounds and standing well over six feet in height. His glandular condition would rule his life for the next 21 years as he reached the height of 7 feet 9 inches and weighed 478 pounds. Later in life, his height would be, would be reported as 7 feet 11 inches, but Guinness listed him as 7 feet 9 inches. Sarah fretted about his growth and took him to see the only doctor that she knew in Whitesburg, the county seat. It was located about 10 miles north of the farm. When they arrived, Martin was wide-eyed. For the first time in his life, he saw a village made up of two churches, a courthouse, a jail, and a tavern. There were three or four stores selling household goods and a couple of mechanic shops where farmers had tools made and repaired. There was also a school, an attorney, and a doctor to serve the 50 or so residents. The doctor knew something about giants, although he had never seen one. He knew of no way of life, no way to stifle Martin's growth. Martin's height and weight were proportioned, and he was strong as most men. When they returned home, Sarah decided to, to be protective of her youngest child. 
So at age seven, he was not allowed to exert himself at work or at play. She was afraid he might pop or explode, so his physical activity was limited. She remembered what a bright child he was. He had an un almost photographic mind for names, places, and dates, so he became the family tutor. The youngest was soon studying the most advanced text used by older children in their classes. Over time, he gradually learned all the material studied by his older siblings. Sarah was happy with this arrangement because she worried about Martin's future after she passed on. She learned a fairly new Methodist college across Pine Mountain in Virginia. Emory and Henry's campus was also about 85 miles away. Martin enrolled for one academic year at age 16, after which he returned to Whitesburg where he passed the school board exam for the new teachers and was then appointed the teacher at Kanoa's one-room schoolhouse. Martin loved teaching there. He knew the subjects well, and his students were from his own family and other nearby farms. He found the place that Sarah wanted for him, a place where he fit in and he could be useful to society. Seven years of teaching passed quickly, and Martin's happiness was soon to fade. In 1860, voters from the East, North, and West elected a new American president, Abraham Lincoln. He was born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, and became a successful attorney in Illinois. He was also a politician, and after representing the Whig Party for 20 years, helped form the Republican Party. Lincoln was the Republican Party's nominee and won the national election. The question of slavery had been an issue for years, and Kentuckian Henry Clay was famous for his efforts to hold the nation together. His compromises in 1820 and 1850 had held both sides of the slavery question in check, but now the South felt a new threat from a new leader of a new party. Within six months of Lincoln's election, 11 southern states succeeded, and in April of 1861, they attacked Fort Sumter. A Union depot in Charleston Harbor, the Civil War, had begun. Sarah's poor farm owned no slaves. There were only 17 slaves among the 2,700 or so Letcher County residents in those days. Since her husband had died two decades earlier, they no longer swapped land as an income source. The farm produced corn as their staple along with oats, wheat, rye, buckwheat, and potatoes. They also raised hogs and cattle, but they weren't rich. The census listed all the property owners in it with a value of 600 to $5,000, and the Bates were not listed. So with no slaves or plantation lifestyle to protect, why did Martin and four of his brothers enlist in the Confederacy in 1861? Probably at the urging of Ben Cottle. Cottle was a well-known preacher before the war, he used his popularity to recruit more than 1,000 men from the, 50, from the 5th Kentucky's Infantry. The Bates brothers signed on for one year, expecting the war to be short-lived, but a year later, Martin left them to re-enlist in the cavalry. He joined the French's battalion of Virginia as 1st Lieutenant in Company A. Bates much preferred the riding of a horse to the marching of his feet. At his size, this always presented a problem for his unit. Whenever they could, they stole the, la the larger draft horse they could find to keep Bates in action. One Union report said that he was big as five men but fought like 50. He had entered the service as a private and had been promoted as he continued to prove himself. Now, as a lieutenant who could not only read and write, do arithmetic, and lead others, many of the skirmishes and battles Bates fought in were part of the command of General John Hunt Morgan from Lexington, while Lee, Grant, and others were commanding troops in thousands who would meet on the battlefield until one side or the other retreated or surrendered, leaving thousands dead from their efforts. Morgan, the rebel raider, never had more than 2,500 troops under his command at any time. His mission was to disrupt Union gains in Kentucky. His men destroyed as many roads, tunnels, and railways as they could. He wanted to drive the Union troops out of the Commonwealth with the hope that Kentucky would then become a rebel state. Kentucky entered the war as the second richest state in the South, trailing only Mississippi with all of its cotton plantations. As such, Kentucky would be a great prize for whichever side it eventually joined. Bates saw action in Virginia protecting the salt mines at Saltville and the lead mines at Withville, as well as Gladeville, now Wise. In Kentucky, he had been at Perryville in 1862 as part of Morgan's Fort's first raid. Later, he fought a Mount Sterling, 2nd Cynthia, 
Middle Fork, and the Cumberland Gap, where he was wounded. In 1863, Major French, who had been an attorney in Wise before the war, now wanted to set up a recruitment center near Pinkton, now Pikeville, to enlist enough new soldiers to become a full regiment. Union officials learned of these efforts and sent Colonel John Dills, commander of the 39th Kentucky Regiment, to run the rebels back into Virginia. Dills' troops consisted mostly of mountain men who knew the countryside from their hunting and trapping days. They decided to leave in the middle of the night and arrive before French's men were even out of bed. The plan worked so well that after exchanging shots for an hour or two, French ran up a white flag because his men were out of ammunition. Dills, to his surprise, had captured Major French, 16 officers, 70 enlisted men, and one giant. Dills had all the Confederate supplies destroyed, then transported his captives back to Louisiana, then on to Louisville, and finally to Camp Chase near Columbus, Ohio, where they would be held as prisoners of war. He got most of them on horseback, but there was no horse big enough to carry Bates. He quickly command commandeered a flatboat located on the Big Sandy River, and he, Major French, and the giant rode as others pushed their boat up the river. Dills enjoyed the company of the French and Bates so much that upon reaching their destination, he requested a prisoner exchange for both men. They were moved to Camp Chase, but 33 days later, on May 13, 1863, both were exchanged. While in Ohio, Bates met another prisoner of the war named Colonel Clarence Prentice, who was the son of George Prentice, publisher of the Louisville Courier. George Prentice had used his considerable influence as publisher of the state's most read newspaper to sway President Lincoln to almost exchange his son for another prisoner. The terms of these exchanges were that each prisoner would be freed, they would lay down their arms, and would return to their homes to fight no more. There probably was a never a more hollow promise made for Bates, French, and Prentice, as all immediately returned to action. French was reassigned to the 63rd Virginia, and Prentice was asked to take up French's old position, leading the 65th Virginia, which included Bates. Prentice and Bates soldiered on together until the end of the war. Bates' release was signed by Prentice, who explained that he could no longer find a suitable mount for the giant. It was then signed by John Hunt Morgan. Bates considered returning to Letcher County after his discharge, but he knew that both sides had looted and commandeered the farms and assets for four years. He determined it would be years before the farm could be productive again and that it would be better for him to leave so there'd be fewer mouths to feed. Prentice had another idea. He had seen firsthand how Yankee troops feared and yet were in awe of the giant. Prentice offered to take Bates home with him to Louisville. In the River City, Prentice would parade his friend from one saloon to another along Fifth Street, extracting bets from many patrons as he could. Prentice was, Prentice was sure the two could continue that way for a long time, and, and who knows how far that might have lasted before Prentice's tragic end. He was crossing Fifth Street while intoxicated and stepped in front of a large wagon pulled by a team of horses. The horses and the wagon ran over him, killing him in the street. Bates pondered Prentice's death and decided he could improve his life by joining the Wiggins and Bennett Circus in Cincinnati. The circus billed him as the tallest man in the world, advertising him as being 7 foot 11 inches tall. Instead of being the target of scorn, the circus presented Bates as a learned man who had taught school and fought in the war. Bates displayed his pistols, which he had worn in the in holsters that crisscrossed his chest. Each gun was a 71 caliber made for him by the tread... I'm going to spell this because I can't pronounce it and you all may know what it is. T-R-E-D-A-G-A-R, -E -A -A easy for you to say, Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. He also showed audiences a sword that he had never used in the war. It was 55 inches long, 18 inches longer than a standard issue. Audiences were encouraged to ask questions, which Bates very much enjoyed answering. Besides the farm, teaching, and the war, Bates had talked about various giant myths and tales. He also shared his sizes. He wore a 20 boot that he filled with half a bushel of corn for effect. His shirt was made by the Catskill Company, and they were 74 inches long, 96 and a half inches at the waist, 96 and a half inches at the waist, 63 inches in the middle of the back, with a 25-inch neck and an 18-inch waistband. 
Each shirt took six yards of muslin, one and three quarter yards wide, wide, and cost two dollars and fifty cents. Who could afford plenty of shirts because the circus paid him a hundred dollars a month? His popularity with the audiences grew regularly. Long before radio, television, and movies, the Kentuckian had become a superstar. As his fame grew, so did interest from the other circuses. And four years later, Bates moved on to the W.W. Cole Circus, Menagerie, and Museum, where he was promised more travel and greater exposure. They paid him $400 a month at the time when the average U.S. wage earner earned $129 a year. Meanwhile, the Millbrook, now New Annan, Nova Scotia, Canada, a daughter had been born to two average-sized adults. In 1846, Anna Hanning Swan was born to a former Scotsman named Alexander Swan and Anne Graham Swan of Nova Scotia. Anna was one of the dozens of children, all a normal size. She was also a product of glandular growth. She'd been 18 inches at birth, but by her birthday she stood 4, four feet and 6 inches. Two years later, she stood 5 feet 2 inches, nearly as tall as her mother, and on her 11th birthday, Anna was 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighed 212 pounds. Four years later, she was more than 7 feet tall. By her 17th birthday, she had reached a full height of 7 feet 11 inches. When Anna was 16, her height had attracted the attention of P.T. Barnum, who operated a museum near Broadway in New York City. Barnum offered Anna her ma and her mother $23 a week in gold and covered all their expenses for them to come to New York and appear on his stage. In addition, he paid for tutors three times a week, their trip home three times a year, and an oversized carriage built for the travel around town. The carriage was pulled by two white horses, each standing 18 hands tall. Of course, when people saw the giant outfit, many would follow it back to the museum where Mr. Barnum would sell them an admission ticket to the next show. Anna and her mother had an apartment on the third floor of the building that housed the museum. Their apartment featured private bedrooms, but they shared the kitchen and the living room with each other and the acts, including Tom Thumb and his wife, Lavinia. During their third year in New York, the museum caught fire on the main floor and all the exits were blocked. The performers rushed upstairs where they were able to climb out on the third floor window, all but Anna. She was too large to get through the window, so museum workers had to make an opening big enough for her. They found a block and tackle and hoist, and they hoisted her through the opening and down three floors to safety. In all, it took 18 men to get her down to the ground. Anna and her mother took some time off from the show after the fearful bout with the fire. A couple of years later, the building again caught on fire, and Barnum had to close the museum. He sent many of his acts out of town for appearances that would enable him to pay the bills while he waited for construction to be completed in New York. Judge H.P. Ingalls owned the contract of Martin Van Buren Bates and offered to, have to hire Anna for a proposed tour of the United Kingdom. The Giants would receive top billing, and by appearing together, they would draw much larger audiences than appearing, appearing individually. The contract was signed in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and their ship, the city of Brussels, set sail. Ten days later, on May the 2nd, 1871, they landed, but something had changed. Martin and Anna had fallen in love. Besides their attraction based on size, they were both intelligent, witty, and would prove to be kind to each other. Martin did not like the fact that Anna was taller than him, so she agreed to always wear flats. Judge Jingles had been prom the promoter all of his life, and he recognized an opportunity when it was presented to him. Ingalls immediately contacted the press upon their arrival. They were going to stay in Liverpool at the Washington Hotel for a week before moving on to London. Martin and Anna lived, left on May 19th and upon their arrival gave a reception on King Street for both the press and the medical community. As physicians asked their questions, members of the press wrote stories for the next day's papers. Obviously, the two giants, planning to marry, attracted much attention. Half of England was enthralled, claimed one newspaper. Among the British interested in the story was Her Gracious Majesty Queen Victoria. On May 29th, Martin and Anna received an official invitation to appear at Buckingham Palace three days later. It was one of the three invitations Martin and Anna would receive from the Queen. At the first meeting, they were warmly welcomed, and His Majesty surprised them with gifts of an offer to arrange their wedding. 
The ceremony was held on June 17, 1871 at Trafalgar Square in the Church of St. Martin in the Fields, one of England's most famous non-cathedral churches. The Queen arranged for one of Anna's countrymen to officiate, Rev. Rupert Cochran of Halifax, said the vows while the church vicar, Rev. Dr. Roberts, assisted. Martin wore a black suit that displayed the large jeweled watch Her Majesty had given him at the first meeting. Each of them had received a watch said to have been the size of a saucer, adorned with diamonds and other jewels, and a six-foot-long chain attached. Each was valued at $1,000. Anna wore a wedding dress made for her by the Queen's staff. They used 100 yards of white satin embossed with orange blossoms. Another 50 yards of silk was used to make the veil. She also wore a brooch and a wedding ring made for her by the Queen's staff. The wedding ring was massive, made of seven diamonds in a cluster. Judge Ingalls gave the bride away, and the best man was the Honorable Henry Lee, scientific editor of The Land and Water. A reception was held after the ceremony in the house they rented at 45 Craven Street. After the noon reception, the couple left for a brief honeymoon at the Star and Garter Hotel in Richmond. On June 21st, they went back to London, being received by the Prince of Wales and his guest, the Grand Duke Vandermeer of Russia and Prince John of Luxembourg, among others. Together, the Giants made four trips to Europe, where they appeared before large crowds. On one of these trips, they appeared before Princess Christina of Denmark. When they returned to America, they continued to appear before every growing audiences. That included Presidents James A. Garfield and William M. McKinley. At that time, they were both being paid $400 a month for the presentations. Anna told stories, played the piano and sang, while Martin was a glib storyteller. They were anything but circus freaks. During their second year of marriage, Martin and Anna made medical history. Anna delivered a baby girl measuring 27 inches long and weighing 18 pounds. Although stillborn, she was the first baby to be a, a born a giant. Both parents mourned the loss and perhaps recalling the fears the parents had when they were children, donated the body to the London Hospital for scientific study. After a few more years of hectic travel, the two were visiting friends in Ohio where they found a 130-acre piece of land and they both loved it. It had fertile land and was located about 60 miles south of Lake Erie and 22 miles west of Akron. Akron. They bought it and immediately began turning it into a farm for their pleasure. They had a house and a barn built to their great specifications. The walls of the buildings were 14 feet tall with doors that were 8.5 feet high. The doorknobs stood about 5 feet off the floor. All the furniture was custom made to fit their bodies. Their bed was 10 feet long. When visitors were struggling to climb into chairs, <laughs> the giants were amused. Martin and Anna also kept pets in the house, including a giant boa constrictor. They could appear anywhere as it crawled around the house. A large parrot that Martin had trained to say, Get off my property! When provoked, and a monkey Anna named Buttons, who was kept on a chain outside so that it could run around their yard. The farm was home to the finest animals they could find. Martin and Anna owned Norman draft horses and full stock short horned cattle. Martin had a carriage built to fit them and was pulled by two Clydesdale horses standing 18 hands high. In 1878, the Giants decided to go back on tour because the cost of the farm had exceeded their initial expectations. They signed a three-year contract with W. W. Cole's new Colossal Shows, which was following the newly laid railroads in the western frontier. This allowed Martin and Anna to see a great deal of the American unknown to most citizens. They wanted to be the first circus shows in places such as Denver, Kansas City, and San Francisco. Large crowds met them at each new location, and lo local settlers attended the events for the entertainment and to learn the news of the day. In 1879, Anna, de Anna delivered a second child. Her son lived only 11 hours, despite two doctors attending the delivery. He weighed 23 and a half pounds and was 28 inches long. He was as large as the six-month-old at birth, but he did not survive. This time they buried their baby next to Anna's sister Maggie, at Mount Hill Cemetery near Seville. Maggie had visited the Spates farm in 1875 and while there died of an unknown illness. After the second birth, Anna never seemed to regain her strength. She had exhibited previously. Nine years later, in 1888, Anna became ill and never recovered. 
On August 5, 1888, she was pronounced dead from tuberculosis, one day before her 42nd birthday. She had been a member of the local Baptist church where they had built a special pew for the giants, and a taught Sunday school, and occasionally played the piano, where she and Martin were in town. Martin ordered an eight-foot casket for Anna's burial, but when it arrived from Cleveland, it was only normal size. The carpenter read his order and decided there had to be a mistake, and changed the specifications. This delayed Anna's burial for several days. It infuriated Martin, but also forewarned him of what might happen upon his death. So he had his own coffin built and stored it in the barn rafters until it was needed. When Anna's made-to-order coffin arrived, it took twelve pallbearers to lift it. Martin had her buried near her sister and their second child at Mound Hill. Later, he ordered an eight-foot marble statue, which was chiseled in Italy. When it arrived, it was mounted atop a ten-foot pedestal, so the eighteen-foot-high memorial made to her likeness still stands there today. Across the bottom, he displayed Psalm 17:15, which reads, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. Martin Van Buren Bates was born in Kentucky at the start of the Panic of 1837. He lived to see the end of World War I in 1919. During the 82 years of life, he learned to survive on a small farm without a father. He went away from that life long enough to become a teacher in a one-room school until the Civil War developed. He and four of his brothers enlisted to fight a war that they didn't understand. He was wounded, captured, exchanged as a prisoner of war during that time. Searching for a way of life that used all those experiences, he found his way to circus life. Long before radio, television, and movies, he was the Kentucky-born entrepreneur and entertainer who became rich while traveling the globe. But in the final analysis, his life was not made complete, and he did not know true happiness until he met and married his love, Anna. Well, I found that very interesting. I hope you did, too. It was written by Richard Crow. If you'd like to go to the museum and see these giants, they are in Seville, Ohio. They're called the Seville Giants. Remember, Captain M.V. Bates and Anna Bates were their names. And I've also learned that Captain Bates was a cousin to Devil John Wright. So there's a lot of history here in the beautiful mountains of southwest Virginia. I'm Rosalie Gilchrist. I want to thank you for watching ARC TV. We enjoy bringing it to you as much, I hope, as you enjoy watching.